these days, basically everybody has a decently powerful computer right in their pocket. But it wasn't always this way. Back about 40 years ago, or in the early 1980s, if you wanted or needed computing on the go, you had to go and get yourself one of these. the Osborne One personal computer released to the public on April 3rd, 1981, and this was the world's first mass market portable computer. It features a Zilog Z80 CPU clocked at 4 MHz and it has 64 kilobytes of RAM. And uh, yeah, here it is. You might be thinking, where's the screen? Where's the keyboard? How do you use it? It just looks like a sewing machine. So you set it down like this, and then you release these little clips, and the keyboard folds down like so revealing the disk drives and the screen, as well as a few other things. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty elegant design, I'd have to say. With the keyboard removed, we can see a variety of ports along the bottom, such as one for a modem, an RS-232 serial port, an IEEE 488 port, and there's where the keyboard plugs in, brightness and contrast controls for the internal screen, a connector to hook up an external screen, a reset button, and a connector labeled battery. Around the back we have our carry handle, as well as this little door here, which flips up, revealing a little compartment to stuff the power cord, as well as the power switch, a fuse, and a place to connect the power cord. And there's also this little slidey thing on top, which pops open like so, revealing a vent for cooling, which you should open when using the machine for long periods of time. And for those of you who are wondering, this thing weighs around 25 pounds, so calling it portable is a bit of a stretch. These types of computers are commonly referred to as luggables, and they predate laptops by a few years. Personally, I think these old suitcase-style portables have quite a bit of charm. So to truly appreciate the Osborne, you have to compare it to a typical computer from around that time, like this one, this Commodore PET 8032. And uh, yeah, this thing is very unportable. I hate moving this thing. It's really heavy, really awkward to carry. Yeah, it's just not portable. I have taken it places, and I really don't like taking it places. But also to match what the Osborne includes for, and you'd also need to carry this dual disk drive and a box of disks, which... Yeah, this is not very portable. There's no way you're going to be able to carry both these things at once. So when you compare it to something like this, the Osborne really does start to look quite portable and compact and practical. So uh, let's fire it up. But before we do that, I would like to announce that I will be attending the World of Retro Computing Expo here in Kitchener, Ontario. It will be happening this year on September 16th and 17th from 12pm to 5pm on each day. And uh, yeah, it's a free event and this Osborne will be there, so come check it out if you're in the area. We'll need to insert a boot disk. The Osborne includes these two little cubbies below the disk drives for you to store your floppy disks, which is a really nice inclusion. Upon power up, the Osborne prompts us with this message to insert a disk into drive A, which we already did, so we'll press enter. And then it brings us to this help thing. We can press various letters to get to various help pages. That will give us a little bit of information about various programs that the Osborne shipped with. We can hit escape to break out to a CPM prompt. And yes, this does run CPM, which stands for Control Program Monitor or Control Program Microcomputer, depending on who you ask. CPM was a super popular operating system for business computers during the late 70s into the very early 1980s. It's pretty similar to MS-DOS, so if you're familiar with DOS, CPM won't feel all that foreign. When it comes to using the Osborne, it's basically just a CPM machine, and it can run a wide variety of CPM applications. And much of the CPM software library was made up of business and productivity applications. The Osborne actually shipped with quite a number of popular applications from the time, including WordStar, which was a common word processor back in the day. This program also gives me a good opportunity to demonstrate one of the tricks that the Osborne has, or more like trade-offs. You see, most business applications from back in the day were designed to run in 80 columns, meaning that the screen is 80 characters across. 
So in order to be compatible with a lot of productivity applications from back in the day, the Osborne would need to have an 80 column screen. But the problem is, when you try to fit that many characters on the screen, you make the characters that small, they become basically unreadable on the Osborne's tiny 5 inch CRT screen. And when I say tiny, I really do mean tiny. It's only 5 inches across as I said. Here's a stick of butter for scale. Okay, maybe that's not the best object I could have used. So uh, here's a 3.5 inch floppy disk. Actually, it's about the same size as a cassette tape. So the solution was to only display part of the screen at once and then just sort of scroll around. So as you can see when I'm typing, it's going across the screen and once the cursor hits near the edge of the screen, the screen scrolls over. Now I hit, then when I hit enter and the cursor returns to the other end of the screen, it scrolls back. And uh, that's one of the compromises they had to make for portability. Another program I have here is SuperCalc, and it was a popular spreadsheet program for CPM. There is also Microsoft Basic, and this is not the most advanced version of Basic in the world, but it's pretty good. So what about gaming on the Osborne? Since this was designed to be a CPM business machine, you're not going to be seeing any cool graphics on here like on a Commodore VIC-20 or an Apple II. The Osborne is limited to a scrolling stream of monochrome text. So that really limits what you can do on here in terms of gaming. But there are some things you can play on here. Like, of course, text adventures. I really have a lot of respect for people who can really get into and enjoy these kinds of games. There are also things like this chess game, where all the graphics are just made up of text characters and the pieces are just represented by a couple of letters. As you can see, it has to redraw the entire playfield every time you make a move. That's because even though the Osborne has a display built in, it still functions just like a dumb terminal. And the text characters have to be sent one character at a time through serial to the terminal. And the program can't really like write directly to screen memory. That's not really like an Osborne specific thing. That's the way basically all CPM machines work and just, and just a lot of older computers in general mainly old mainframes and really early microcomputers. The Osborne is among the last of personal microcomputers to use a terminal style display. Okay, so enough about the software you can run in here. Let's take some time to talk about the Osborne Computer Company. Surely with such a revolutionary product, they would go on to become a major player in the computer industry for years to come. Okay, well, not exactly. The Osborne was a pretty big success initially, but the company would go on to make a fatal mistake. Shortly after the Osborne 1 was released, they would announce an improved version of the Osborne. When people saw the new version, sales for the current version dried up because people you know, didn't want to buy the current version when a new version could come out any time. And consumers just figured they would wait for the new version to come out, or at least you know, wait for the new version to come out and then buy the current version when it goes on sale. But the problem was, the new and improved version was nowhere near ready to release. And even though the Osborne's status as the first portable computer will remain forever, its status as the only portable computer was relatively short-lived. Within the next couple of years, numerous other portable computers hit the market, like the K-Pro, the Compaq, the Commodore SX-64, the TRS-80 Model 4P, the Hyperion, and the IBM 5155, among others. So when the new and improved Osborne did eventually release, it struggled to compete in the marketplace. In 1983, the Osborne Computer Corporation would file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy before going under completely in 1985. Really goes to show you can have a revolutionary groundbreaking product and how it can all come crashing down due to a simple marketing blunder. The Osborne Computer Corporation had the potential to be one of the biggest names in the industry, but instead it just became an obscure relic of the past.